It is time for us to get started this morning. We are very, very thankful that you are here. Uh, if you're basing everything on the, the chatter, we are glad to be here. And uh, if you are visiting with us, we're very honored that you come to be with us this morning. Invite you to fill out a visitor's card, if you will, please. You can just pass that to the center aisle. Uh, members, please fill one of those cards out uh, as well. Our next service will be at 1.30 this afternoon, and uh, we pray that you can be with us then. And then on Wednesday night, we're in the midst of a, a really good study. Uh, Lee Cox is our speaker. We have a different speaker each Wednesday night. I uh, encourage you to come from, for that at 7 o'clock. I think you'll really uh, be blessed uh, as we're looking at, at culture and that type of thing uh, and different themes there. We still have uh, several folks that are sick. Uh, uh, Brendan Jones has finally finished his uh, treatments, uh, still not feeling well. Uh, Nancy Marler, plans had been for her to go home uh, tomorrow. I'm not real sure whether that will happen or not. She, she's sleeping a lot now and not able to do the therapy, so uh, hopefully we'll find out tomorrow about that. Uh, Janelle Davis, still taking radiation and chemo. Uh, Mary Martin, Jim's sister, uh, we, uh, we've been praying for her. She's been in the hospital, out of the hospital. Uh, but Sue McCord, Jim's sister, Kate, I said Sue, didn't I? Kay McCord uh, had been helping, actually, with Mary. She passed away yesterday. So Jim has one sister that's not well at all and another that seemed to be doing better. <laughs> Uh, she died yesterday. Uh, not a service now, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later as well. Uh, Seaburn Angel, he is back at home. Uh, they're going into the home that the nurses are to try to give some therapy there, so still a, a difficult situation for him. Uh, John Gardner, we've been praying for him because of leukemia. Uh, Laura Brown, she did have her surgery a week ago Friday. She's doing much better uh, this time than she did uh, last time. And I know our family appreciates your prayers there. Kara Reed, Kara continues to make some progress. Uh, as of the 15th of the month, uh, this coming month, she'll become an outpatient. She'll still uh, stay at, at Shepherd Pathway there in Atlanta. Uh, but at that point, um, uh, her mother will be coming home, uh, won't be allowed to, to stay with her, but um, they're still working on, on the trick, trick and, and different problems that she has, but progress is being made. Uh, Charlie Vandergriff's not feeling well today. Uh, Roger Bentley, Roger's here, but he's going to have some surgery tomorrow at uh, Tenova up in Turkey Creek out of Knoxville. His surgery will be at 1.30, so uh, please keep Roger in your prayers, especially tomorrow. Uh, Friday night, uh, parents night out to 5 uh, to 8. Uh, next Sunday, the first Sunday of the month, will be our fellowship meal. So please uh, plan to be here next Sunday and, and stay for that meal. Our Silver Saints group now has a newsletter. Uh, Mary Scarlett is taking care of that. It's, it's laying on the table out front. If you're a part of that group, uh, pick one of those up. And if you'd like to be a part of it, uh, pick that up as well. Along that line, uh, the... Uh, Sound of Music play is going on over at Lee College. Uh, and uh, Friday night, uh, there are those that are thinking about going. If you're interested in going to that play, you can talk to, to Rick Compton about that on Friday night. Also, uh, we went to the Playhouse yes, uh, last year, uh, one of the plays out there at the Cumberland County Playhouse. And there's a couple of thoughts towards going back again if you have an interest in that or the play, you can talk to Rick about that. Uh, yesterday was our spring picnic. If you were here, uh, it was wonderful. Uh, good crowd, and if you didn't make it, uh, you missed a lot of fun. Uh, little ones all over the place. Uh, and uh, it, it was just really good, and we really appreciate everybody that, uh, from Matthew down uh, to everybody that helped plan and, and work uh, with that. I think that's, that's everything. If I've missed something, if you let me know, or someone, we'll try to do that at the next service. Stephen is our song leader this morning. Um, 
Jim McCord has the, uh, the prayer and the Bible reading. Uh, I'll be taking care of the Lord's Supper. And John Young uh, will uh, have our dismissal prayer. We begin our worship service. Let's turn to number 305. Number 305. Number 299.
scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of First Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through the remainder of the chapter. Ephesians, chapter 1, beginning with verse 15. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks to you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the works of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he was raised, when he has raised him from the de dead and seated him on his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things in the church, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fits all in all. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we are indeed thankful for this assembly this morning. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to assemble here together, to study a portion of your word, and to dwell upon those things which you have told us and have promised to us and are fulfilled. Father, we at this time come to you thanking you for all the things that you do for us, that you might guide us in such a way that we might become children of yours, that we might do those things which you would have us to do, and that in so doing, we might bring others to you also. Father, we thank you for providing us with the knowledge and the understanding that we might be able to teach your words to others. And we ask, Father, that you guide us, strengthen us, that we might do so throughout our life on this earth. Father, we know that from time to time that we do err, and we ask, Father, for forgiveness for those errors that we have made and we repent, as we repent of them. We ask, Father, that you be with us in, in all the things that we do. We thank you, Father, for your son who came to this earth to die for us, that we might have a hope of eternal life. And Father, we ask that you guide us in that way, that we might also be of service to you throughout our life, and that we continue to live as you would have us to do. For these things we ask in Christ's name, amen. If you'd like to mark your hymnals to number 886, that'll be the song of encouragement this morning. Number 886, following the lesson. The song before the lesson, let's stand and sing number 303, the first and second verse of 303. We saw the
It's good to see all of you here. We're glad you've come out to spend some time uh, worshiping God with us today. Uh, if you're a visitor here, we hope that you uh, uh, fill out one of those attendance cards in front of you and uh, we'll uh, uh, have somebody come by and, and pick those up. If you're a member, find somebody that you may not know and get to know them a little bit better. Uh, it's always good to have uh, relationships and friendships in the church. Uh, I think you'll find that we're a, a church that wants to be the church that Christ intended. We want to do things the way Christ instructed us to do and to uh, worship and to uh, love as Christ has taught us to worship and love. And so uh, we hope that you uh, will stick around and get to know everyone and uh, 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 we're going to be uh, continuing on a series that we began a couple weeks ago uh, today, uh, a series looking at the events leading up to, and now we have uh, uh, finally arrived at the moments that we've uh, been leading up to, the, the cross and the aftermath of the cross. Uh, we talked about uh, the, the time that Jesus spent uh, leading up to the cross. Uh, he spends his time teaching. Uh, he goes and gathers his disciples around and he tells them about uh, the destruction that's going to come to Jerusalem and how he wishes it could be averted. He talks about uh, the importance of, of being prepared for the day of judgment because the day of the Lord is going to come and on that day the righteous will be separated from the wicked. He spends time serving his disciples. He washes their feet and they, they share a meal together and they, uh, they have that final institution of the Lord's Supper, a remembrance uh, of what Christ has done and who he's, uh, uh, what he's about to do at that point. He goes to the garden and he prays and he prays fervently and he wants to be around his friends and he gathers his closest friends together, Peter, James, and John, and they're there in the midst of the garden, but they can't stay awake, and Jesus is betrayed. Last week we talked about Jesus at the crucifixion, how they, they nailed him to a cross, and he suffered and died. But he didn't suffer in vain. He didn't suffer as though it were out of his control. He was very much in control, and this was not just a, you know, an abuse of a, of a helpless man. This was the Son of God who could have called 10,000 angels, as we like to sing, and he died willingly, sacrificially. For you and for me. And so as we think about the life that Jesus has lived up until this point, Jesus has done a lot of incredible things. In his ministry, although fairly short, just about three years or so, uh, Jesus has done a great deal. Think about some of the incredible moments of healing that Jesus had in his ministry. You might think about when Jesus heals the sight of the blind man. You can imagine how crippling and how, how difficult life would be if you could not see, especially in this day and age of, of these biblical times. That would be so difficult. And he restores sight to the blind. Think about the leper who's been ostracized from society and his body is falling apart, literally, and he's suffering great painful wounds all over his body. You know, there's a shame aspect when he goes into public places. He has to cry out that he's a leper and people avoid him. Jesus heals the leper. He touches the leper and heals him. You think about some of the amazing teachings that Jesus has had throughout his ministry. Think about uh, perhaps the Sermon on the Mount, which is probably the greatest block of teaching uh, in the whole Bible. Jesus says and calls his disciples to lift a higher standard. He says, you've heard it said this, but I tell you this. You know, you've heard it said, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't uh, murder your brother, but I say, don't even hate him. You know, there's, there's a higher calling to which he calls his disciples. And you think about, you know, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. you know, causing his disciples to think about how they interact with, with others and how they treat others. And, and to, to be called to live and live well. To live godly lives. And finally, you might think about some of the incredible claims that Jesus makes. You know, when the, the sinful woman comes to Jesus and Jesus is dining in the, the Pharisee's house... Uh, she comes to him and she uh, weeps and washes his feet and uh, he says, your sins are forgiven you. And people are, are taken aback because who can forgive sins but, but God? 
Jesus makes the claim, one, to be able to forgive sins, and Jesus also makes the claim to be the Son of God, to be God himself. Periodically throughout the New Testament, you see Jesus make claims. He, he talks about himself as the Son of Man. Uh, others talk to him often about the, as being the Son of God. Jesus refers to uh, himself as being one with God. Uh, he, talks, he takes the title that God gives himself, the name that God gives himself, the, the great I Am. Jesus takes that and applies it to himself. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And those are some remarkable claims. And it's because of those claims and the things that Jesus has done and the, the incredible life that they crucified him. And now we're going to look at the, the resurrection the empty tomb, which certifies that all of those things that Jesus did and all of those things, most importantly, that he claimed to be, you know, the, the forgiveness of sins, the Son of God, to be God himself, those are proven true in the resurrection. So what we're going to do today, we're going to look at four different uh, brief little uh, blips in this story, uh, brief little encounters in this uh, resurrection story. And then I want to pull a couple lessons, and uh, the lesson will be yours. So let's, uh, let's start with uh, John chapter 19, immediately after the crucifixion. In John chapter 19, you have uh, Jesus, his body on the cross. Uh, he has just died. Uh, and then verse 38, And after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. And so he came and took away his body. And Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. And they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen cloths, uh, and with spices, and as in the burial custom of the Jews." So as Jesus is there up on the cross, uh, a very wealthy man, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, and a wealthy man, Nicodemus, who are both disciples of Jesus, but, but secretly, they come and they bring their faith out in the open, and they say, we're going to take the body of Jesus. You know, I, I think it's an incredible thing that, that Joseph was a disciple, but, but a secret disciple. And it even tells you why he was a secret disciple. He's a secret disciple because he was afraid of the Jews. And there was a reason for that fear. That's not irrational. Look at what they had just done to Jesus. Look at the death that he had just died and the painful beatings and the mockings. You would have a reason in this time right now. Imagine this is, you're in this scenario you would have it, there would be an overwhelming atmosphere of fear. You know, if they did this to Jesus, then what are they going to do to me? And yet, Joseph has the courage to step out and to make his discipleship known, to step out from the darkness and then appeal to take the body away. And he's given permission and he he does so, and he, he offers up his own tomb, a, a new fresh-cut tomb uh, to lay Jesus' body in. And, and it's not just Joseph of Arimathea, it's Nicodemus also. And, and perhaps Nicodemus, seeing the courage of Joseph, then finds his own courage to stand up and, and to do what he's been desiring to do. Nicodemus is an interesting character. You, you first see him early in the Gospel of John, and you see him... Uh, and on one other occasion in the Gospel of John, each time you see him, he gets a little bit closer and a little bit closer to an outward, open faith in Christ. The, the first time he comes to Jesus by night, uh, and, and that's where we have that, that incredible John uh, chapter 3 and a lot of incredible things that are taught there. But he comes at, to Jesus at night. He doesn't want other people to know that he's meeting with Jesus. He's perhaps afraid as well. The second time we see Nicodemus, Jesus is, uh, you know, being questioned by a lot of men. And Nicodemus is, is the one who stands up for Jesus and says, listen, we can't just, you know, willy-nilly forget all these laws and customs and, and the, the way things should be done. We need to, to, to treat Jesus justly. And he stands up for Jesus. And now, finally, he's out in the open. 
And he offers 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes and, you know, funeral preparatory materials to Jesus. That's a lot of money. You know, your, your translation may say something like a hundred liters or, or something like that. It's hard to kind of quantify, uh, you know, what, how much this exactly was. Probably our best, our best estimate is probably this, about 75 pounds of, of these mixtures. You know, Nicodemus was a wealthy man. And why had he had so much of this on hand? Probably to prepare for his own funeral. Well, his own, uh, his own funerals uh, for himself and his, maybe his wife and maybe for family members. This was, this was incredibly valuable materials. And yet he donated all of it to the preparation of Jesus' body. They prepare Jesus' body for burial and Jesus is buried. In Matthew chapter 27, uh, verses 63 through 66 uh, some men come to, uh, some, some of the, the men who crucified Jesus come to uh, Pilate and they say, Sir, we remember how the imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I'll rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he's risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. And they went to the tomb and secured it by sealing the stone and setting a guard. And so the tomb that Jesus is laid in is then, is then you know, heavily armed. There's people who are afraid that Jesus is going to, uh, Jesus was talking before his death about he's going to come back in three days. And they want to make sh- absolutely sure that there's not a doubt in anyone's mind that Jesus was just merely an imposter. That, that because, uh, you know, certainly nobody raises from the dead, certainly uh, when, when people come back three days from now and they see his body still there in the tomb, any credibility that Jesus has had will be gone overnight, just evaporated. And so they set a large rolled stone in front of the tomb and, and they set Roman guards uh, to, to make sure that no one steals the body and the tomb is sealed. And that's on Friday, the day of the crucifixion. Imagine what, what that Friday would have been like. You know, imagine the, the shock and despair that the disciples must have had. You know, this is the Jesus that they've been following for years. You know, they, they've heard his claims, they've heard his teaching, they've seen him do incredible miracles. And yet here he is, he's, he's dead on a cross. Imagine there's a a great depression that that followed over all of Jesus' disciples. I imagine this is a time of of triumph for Jesus' enemies. You know, those who've been conspiring to have him killed are are likely very happy right now. They've they've accomplished what they've set out to do. I I imagine that this is a, a victory lap for Satan here. And then Saturday passes and all is silent on Saturday. We don't have much or anything really spoken about for that, that Sabbath, uh, that Saturday on, uh, after Jesus dies. You know, I imagine there was great sorrow, great weeping, as the reality of what's actually happened has, has begun to set in. Then on Sunday morning, you have uh, an incredible, incredible thing that happens. There's, as there's a shocking uh, revelation that's made. Uh, what you see is that the tomb is found empty. Verse, uh, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 7. Uh, now after the Sabbath, uh, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to go see the tomb. And behold, there's a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord desi- descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. And the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you've come to seek Jesus who is crucified. He's not here, for he's risen. And he said, Come, see the place where they lay him. Uh, And then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. 
And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, I've told you. And so early on Sunday morning, three days after the event, Mary and uh, uh, Mary and uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, uh, likely Jesus's mother, perhaps, they go to the tomb to see where the body was laid, you know, to to go and, and to mourn and to uh, you know whatever it is that they were planning on doing. But when they get there, to their surprise, the, the tomb is rolled away, the guards are are you know incapacitated. And there's a, an angel sitting on the stone, and, and he tells them, what, why have you, I, I know why you're here, but, but look somewhere else, because he's not here. He has risen. He's, he's gone. The tomb's empty. And you follow John's account of the Gospels. Mary, uh, they go back to the, uh, the disciples, and they tell the disciples, and, uh, and Peter and John run and race to the tomb. And you have perhaps the, the best uh, slight, uh, slight that's ever been recorded for all the time. Uh, John, writing the Gospel of John, uh, accounts that, that he outran Peter. And I know there's a little bit of tension there, I'm sure. I bet Peter didn't like that all that much. But John writes that, that they race to the tomb, and John outruns Peter, and he looks in and he sees that, that the tomb is empty. But Peter, in stereotypical Peter fashion, runs straight into the tomb. And he confirms that the tomb's empty. Jesus isn't here. And then you see in John chapter 20, what the angel has told Mary, uh, the Marys, comes to pass. That Jesus is going to appear uh, to his disciples. And then on that, the, the evening of that day, the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And it, again, you have this, this atmosphere of fear and confusion. The disciples are gathered together. They're hunkered in a room. And the doors are locked because they're afraid of what the people outside might do to them. And Jesus appears in their midst. And he says, peace be with you. You know, I, I imagine that would be a, a startling thing to encounter. You know, you're, you're in a locked room. There's, there's 11 of you here. Judas is out of the picture at this point. And then or, uh, 10, because Thomas isn't there either. Uh, you, but you're there in that locked room. And then suddenly, Jesus is there. I, I imagine that gave him a bit of a start. <laughs> and, uh, and Jesus says, peace be with you. Be, be calm. It's okay. And he shows him his hands and his side, that the hands where the nails pierced, and his side where the, the spear of the Roman pierced. And, and they see it, and they understand that this is the risen Lord. That, that he really is here, and they're, they're happy to see it. And you have another encounter, just a couple verses down in verse 24, uh, where Thomas, uh, he wasn't there in that room when Jesus appeared, and he comes back to the disciples and they tell him all about what happened, how Jesus appeared to them. And Thomas says, that cannot be the case. You know, unless I see with my own eyes, you all got to see the hands and the side of Jesus. Unless I get that experience myself and I see his hands and I see his feet and I see the wounds that he's endured, I can't believe it. And so in verse 24, Jesus appears again. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and, and see my hands. and Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So Jesus says to Thomas, Listen, if this is what it's going to take to confirm your faith, then let's do it. You know, Put your finger in, in the hole in my hand where, where the nails have pierced me and, and put your hand on the, my side where the spear has pierced me and, and believe. And I think it's interesting. We, we sometimes give Thomas a, a bad name because of this account. And we say, well, how could anybody disbelieve? How could Thomas be, be doubting Thomas after this? I, I find it interesting that 
we don't actually see that Thomas does that, that Thomas actually has to, to touch the wounds that Jesus has. Immediately after this, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. You know, Thomas hits the nail on the head here. He's, he's absolutely right. You know, Thomas comes to maybe the, the most beautiful profession of faith in, in the Gospels. He's, he's, he's correct. You know, these wounds that Jesus has, his, his very presence in this room is confirmation of who he is. It's confirmation that he is the Lord, that he is the Messiah, the one that's been prophesied about for, for thousands of years uh, you know, in the Old Testament, going back all the way to Adam and Eve. He is the Lord. He is the Messiah. But he's not just a, a, a Messiah as, as like, like David, who was also called a Messiah. He was, he was a special Messiah. He is not just the Messiah, but he is God. My Lord and my God. It's a recognition of the divinity of Jesus. Jesus isn't just a prophet. He's not just a good man. He's not just a teacher of, of wisdom. He, he is the Lord and he is God. And Thomas is exactly right when he says, My Lord, my God. It's so with the fact that the resurrection occurred, what does that mean? What are the implications of the resurrection? Paul talks about this a little bit, and in the bulletin article, if you grab the bulletin, I wrote a little blurb about this, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul here is talking about the resurrection that will happen at the return of Christ, and uh, and there's some in the church at Corinth that are troubling others by saying there, Ill, there will be no resurrection, that, that those who have died before the return of Christ have, have just simply perished, and that's it. That's the end of their existence. And so Paul is writing to refute that idea, and he says, listen, there will be a resurrection of the dead when Jesus comes again. And part of his argumentation is he's talking about the resurrection of Christ himself. And you pick up in verse 14, he says, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Skip down to verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The firstborn of those who have fallen asleep. So Paul here is saying a remarkable thing. He says, listen, if this resurrection has not happened, if Jesus did not truly rise from the dead as, as he prophesied that he would and, and the gospels account, uh, recount that he has, then what are we doing here? Now, why are we worshiping? Why do we call ourselves Christians? Why, why does any of this matter? It's, it's foolishness. It's deception. You know, if Christ has not been raised, then, then the things that we're preaching are worthless. Your faith is worthless. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. The promises that Jesus has made to, to forgive sins and to you know, uh, bring about an inheritance with God and to redeem His people, they're null and void. Those who die, they have no hope. They're, they're just truly gone. If Christ is the only hope we have in this life, we should be pitied. You know, Christ calls us to a life of sacrifice and service. Why would we commit ourselves to sacrifice and service if if Christ has not been, truly been, been raised. Well, shouldn't we commit ourselves to you know, hedonism, to, to seeking pleasure above all others, and, and to whatever other philosophies that may, people may bring up? Sure, why not? And then verse 20, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead. The reality of the situation is that Christ has been raised, and so therefore your faith is not in vain. We're not preaching things futilely. We're not preaching in vain. 
your faith is, is effective and functional and your sins have been forgiven. And that's a big, big implication from the cross, from the empty tomb. Our, our religion, our faith is worthwhile. No, we serve and worship a living and powerful God. In Isaiah chapter 6, you have this incredible scene where Isaiah the prophet is, is brought into the throne room of God in a vision, and he sees uh, the incredible power that God has. You know, he's this tiny ant, and there's this giant throne room all around him, and a giant throne, and on the throne sits the Lord, and his, his robe fills the temple, and it's this incredible, powerful scene. He's surrounded by angels that, that cry out, holy, holy, holy uh, is the Lord. And Isaiah sees all this, and he falls to his knees and says, I am unworthy to be in the presence of God. You know, I'm a sinful man, I have, I am, I'm, I'm weak, I'm small, I'm valuable, and God, in comparison, is infinitely great. He's infinitely powerful, he's infinitely wise, he's infinitely knowing, and yet, that's the God who is infinitely great, that's the God who loves you. You read passages like John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send His Son to the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. You know, that's an incredible thing. You know, our faith is not worthless. We serve a God who has loved us and is powerful and mighty to save and he sent his son to save us. You know, that's a humbling thought. And so we worship him and we serve him, not in foolishness, but because we know the truth of the resurrection. You know, we have a hope that's alive. Uh, two more verses and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. First Peter chapter 1. Verses 3 through 5, uh, Peter is writing here, and he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He's caused us to be born again to a living hope. You know, He's given us a living hope, and look at how He's done it, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the hinge point. That's the reason why we have hope. And here's the hope that we have. An inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. That's been kept in heaven for you. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter says, listen, we, we live with a living hope. It's not vain. It's not futile. It, it's real and it's alive. Just as Christ was raised from the dead to a new life. Uh, we too are raised again to new life. We have hope. You know, Isaiah talks about, uh, Isaiah 52, by his wounds we've been healed. You know, our, our, our struggle with sin has come to uh, an ultimate end. Uh, we still struggle um, here in life, but, but in the end, our, our, our weakness will be resolved and we, will be, be, uh, we, are, we are holy and saved through his blood. You know, we've been secured. Uh, we can have confidence in our faith. Uh, by God's power, we're being guarded through faith for a salvation that's ready to be revealed. You know, Paul says a very similar thing in Ephesians chapter 4. He says that the Holy Spirit has sealed us. Uh, you know, we have confidence that we have a hope. We have confidence that, that the heaven that God has prepared will be there for us. We have confidence that it's going to be unfading and continually glorious and, and a perfect reunion and a perfect relationship with God awaits us. All of that through Christ and through the blood that He shed and the resurrection with which He, uh, he was raised. And So we'll, we'll end on this verse. In Acts chapter 1, verse 11. 
Jesus spends a, a brief period of time after his resurrection on the earth. Uh, and he ascends back into heaven in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. He's, he's gathered by his disciples and he ascends into heaven on a cloud. And, and his disciples are, are still struggling to kind of grasp the fullness of what's going to happen. Uh, they ask, well, Lord, are you going to now restore the kingdom of Israel? And, and they're, they're not, still not quite understanding. But in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, uh, there, Jesus has ascended and they're still looking up. And an angel appears and says... Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? You know, this Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come again in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. And so Jesus is ascended, but he leaves a message of hope. And he leaves uh, another prophecy that, that has, has yet to be fulfilled, that, that he is going to be coming back. When he comes back, as we've seen throughout other places in Scripture, as we saw when he was teaching about the, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, he's going to come back and it's going to be a final event. You know, he's going to come back and he's going to judge the righteous from the wicked, uh, those who are righteous into a, a place of comfort, a place of with the Lord, a place of eternal life. But for those who are wicked... Uh, uh, place of torment and a place of punishment and a, a place apart from God for all of eternity. A place that, that uh, is, is dictated by your own actions. Uh, your sin is what separated you from God. It's just a realization of the weight of your sins. You know, I'm thankful that the tomb was found empty. I'm thankful that our Lord is risen and that through him we have a life that's full of hope and meaning and, and, and life. Our faith is not void. Our faith is not empty. Because we serve a, a risen Lord. And so let's thank God that he sent his son for us. That we might have life through him. And let's honor that sacrifice. This morning, if you need to put Christ on in baptism and become a child of God and, and to uh, accept the salvation and the grace that He's offered you, let me encourage you to do that. Put Christ on in baptism and become a, a part of his, his church, His family. Maybe you are a Christian, but you've not been who you need to be and you need to, to seek prayers of forgiveness and you need to get your life back uh, in line with, with what God would have you to do. Let me encourage you to do that as well. If we can do anything for you, let me encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing.
first day of the week, uh, we are blessed to be able to come together, to assemble together, to partake of the communion of the Lord's Supper. As Matthew has just reminded us, uh, truly Jesus rose from the dead, but he did die. And the communion helps us to recognize and understand and to be reminded of the sacrifice that he made for us, the cruel death that he experienced. But then that, that glorious resurrection. So we can be thankful, but we also need to be reverent, and we also need to honor the Lord for all that he has sacrificed for us. Let's bow and give thanks for the bread. Our Father, we are so thankful for the great love, a love beyond understanding that you would come to this earth, that your son would, would die on a cru cruel cross of Calvary, that he would shed that innocent blood for our guilty stains. And we pray, Father, that, that each week as we partake of this communion, that we will think back to what has been done for us and that we will truly uh, 
be reverent and be respectful towards you for the sacrifice that you made for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's bow once again. Again, Father, we come giving you thanks for the fruit of the vine, which you set aside to, to represent the blood that was shed. And we do pray, Father, that we have a, an understanding of the, the great price that was paid because of the sins of each and every one of us. And we pray, Father, with your help and guidance that we'll never forget that sacrifice. In fact, that that sacrifice will become more precious and more meaningful as we grow older in this life. Thank you, Father, for that sacrifice. Thank you for that blood. Thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents that blood. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Also, on the first day of the week, we are privileged to lay by in store, to give a part of that which the Lord has given to us. In fact, everything belongs to Him. We're simply giving back to Him that which He has uh, first given to us. And it's one of those uh, great privileges. All of us have the privilege and the honor and the ability to give. It doesn't matter how much or how little we have. We can give a part of it, whether it's a nickel or a dime or it's thousands of dollars. One of the great privileges that are given to children of God is the privilege of being able to have a part in the preaching and the teaching, have a part in helping children who are in nursing homes, a privilege of assisting those that uh, have need. And you have a part in that and I have a part in that as we give each Lord's Day. Let's bow. Our Father, we are again thankful that you have honored us with this privilege. We pray, Father, that we will truly be a, a giving people, a generous people, uh, a sacrificial people. We're thankful, Father, that yes, this is something that we are commanded to do, but it's also something that we're privileged to do. We pray, Father, that in our hearts, we truly uh, will give in a way that will be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. There are boxes at each of the uh, exit doors that you can put your contribution in. If you're able to stand for a closing song and remain standing for the closing prayer, number 603, remember these words as we go throughout this week. I never liked to
Bow with me once again, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today, this day that we celebrate is I'll give thanks. Well, I'll give thanks today for our risen Jesus, our risen Savior. He came and shed his blood, but washed his away our sins. We pray for this church here in Dayton. We pray that you will continue to bless us. May we always walk in the right direction and serve you. We pray that our church here is pleasing to you. We know that you are here with us today. I pray that everyone here today's name is written in the book of life today. Go with us now and guide us. Keep everyone safe and guide us back to the next point of time. In Christ's name.